Okay, so now we are on page 38. We are beginning, we are now actually getting into the Shinobi no Maki itself. So we've had a lot of lead in. Now let's get to the document itself. And again, the thing to remember is this document is not meant to be a training manual. It's not meant to be a step-by-step -step instruction. Uh, it is not the Bansen Shukai. So we know the Bansen Shukai is meant to be a catalog, but it's also laid out in an instructional manner. So the idea is if you got your hands on the Bansen Shukai and you started from the beginning and you studied it and you trained in it and you went section by section, you could, you know, be trained um, by the manual. Um, of course, best, you know, if you had an in-person teacher, but the manual contains enough instruction and information that you could have a good foundation. And then, of course, you would want to have an actual teacher to go over the kudin and the fine points, but it's still meant to be a catalog and an instructional manual. That's the Bansin Shukai, for example. Like that, that's kind of like what a lot of people have come to expect. You know, the, oh, I want this manual. You know, I expect this manual to teach me, to train me. <laughs> this Shinobi no Maki is not that. This Shinobi no Maki, as we've discussed numerous times, is a more of a graduation certificate. It kind of just presents some select techniques these techniques by no means represent the entirety of the system they're just a collection of techniques that were selected by Lord uh, Fukushima in order to just build the document and then as we discussed earlier at the end Shinobi uh, uh, Nojiri Narimasa at the end of the Shinobi no Maki wrote a kind of bit of warning there to, you know for anybody that reads the document to understand that the majority of the techniques in this manual are magical and utilitarian it's magic and tools and that the actual shinobi arts are not recorded in the manual like so you would actually be trained in hijitsu slash ninjutsu and then these are the tools and the magics that would accompany the training and so this manual is again more of a memory aid and a ritual document sort of uh, serving as a graduation certificate for lack of a better word with that having been said we move into page 38 which is interlocking dreams now the kanji means dreams interlocked so you can translate it as interlocking dreams or dreams interlocked or locked together dreams but uh, I chose interlocking dreams because it just or inter you know interlocking with a dream so there's a dream and you're, it's interlocking it, there's it, there's there's no more real need to go on about the title interlocking with dreams it's a dream magic uh, it's an old paper spell with roots in the Issei region uh, the Grand Issei Shrine um, a variation of the spell does appear in Inko Ryu Ninjutsu which as we know as I've discussed is related to Fukushima Ryu Ninjutsu um, and more than likely <laughs> The uh, the Inko Ryu spell is a is a descendant of this Fukushima Ryu version of the spell. The um, also I believe that the Kuki traditions have a dream magic spell, but I don't know how similar it is. I have not had a chance to see or analyze their dream magic, but I have heard that they have a dream magic spell which makes good sense because while this spell has roots in Issei it also has roots in Yoshino uh, this entire southern court loyalist and actually a brief history lesson brief, brief history lesson the southern court loyalists are very big on spells and magic and that is might be I'm not going to say it is a hundred percent but it might be the fact that the southern court capital was Yoshino and Yoshino is also the capital of Shugendo for lack of a better word there's a lot of Shugenja and a lot of Shugendo taking place in in this area Yoshino so perhaps because of just the area where the capital was the southern court loyalists are very influenced by an abundance of magical spells Buddhist spells Shugendo spells Taoist spells Shinto spells there's just a lot of magic like for example 
there's an entire set of magics that are, or actual not magic. There's when I say, okay, I need to make a difference here. There's when I say magics, I mean worldly spells, spells that involve worldly gods and worldly spirits. Then there is puja and sadhana. I know I'm using Sanskrit words, but let me explain. Puja is like a a giant ritual, and then sadhana is like a a, a a specific ritual that puja and sadhana are very similar but um when i say puja or sadhana or i say sort of ritual practice i'm talking about buddhist ritual practice like a buddhist ritual a buddhist deity practice a buddhist sort of ceremony puja sadhana ritual when i say magics i mean like Shinto magic, Taoist magic, or a Buddhist practice that is doesn't involve enlightened beings but involves worldly deities, right? So like for example, you can have Buddhist ritual which involves worldly deities, basically like a ritual to placate a particular class of violent spirit. So that kind of sits on the edge because it's using a Buddhist dharmic ideology and method, but it is involved to worldly spirits. And then there's just, so that sometimes is just Buddhist ritual. But then when I say magics, I mean just like, it doesn't really involve anything dharma. It's really like a worldly, worldly methodology, a worldly magic. So the Southern Court loyalists are extremely deep in Buddhist puja, Buddhist sadhana, Buddhist ritual and worldly magics so uh that's something you just kind of gotta understand this idea that you have conspirators who are heavily involved in magics is again that's um uh, something from having come from the southern court loyalist southern court loyalist methodology means you have to be you are well trained in magic so if you're a conspirator you're going to have all these techniques for conspiracy and then you're going to have all of these magics for conspiracy that's that's on one hand that's common for all of the samurai to have some kind of magic but for the southern court loyalist there's like a lot of magic like a lot more than usual it's not unusual for a samurai who's not at all affiliated with southern court ideology to have some kind of spell here and there, but the Southern Court loyalists have a lot of magic. Like a, a, a bunch. <laughs> so, um, and that's probably because of uh, being based out of Yoshino, right? And just We're talking about a hub of magic, a hub of Buddhist ritual, Buddhist puja, Buddhist sadhana, and Taoism, and Shugendo, and Shinto, and just a lot of magics taking place, ritual and magic taking place. So that's something you just have to understand. That having been said, um, the Kuki family, like I was mentioning earlier, the Kuki um, are, well, uh, war, no, sorry, at the t during the Northern and Southern Wars, during the Nanboku Cho, the Kuki were Nancho. They were Southern Court. And a lot of their techniques are similar to Kusunoki, and a lot of their magic is similar because they were Southern Court loyalists. I have no idea <clears throat> how Southern Court loyal they stayed as history went on. I really don't know. But I do know that they retained a lot of Southern Court techniques and they retained a lot of Southern Court magic. And even to this day, like it, sometimes the Kuki family or the Kuki head teachers will, will like put out uh, material going over some of their magic and when I read through one of their books that they put out recently um, it was just I saw so much southern court material in there you know some material that's rooted in southern court loyalist I'm like mm, wow you know that's very interesting but again I don't know how how southern court their ideology is it may not be at all they may not have that the loyalist ideology anymore at all but their techniques and their magic is still clearly influenced by that southern court the period of time where they were southern court loyalist anyway okay that having been said moving on <clears throat> bottom of page 38 i talk about paper spells very common in Nigeria. so the the some people got mad at me when they read this but let me explain why i brought this up the the paper spell 
there's a lot of paper spells okay and so with the paper spell there is also the idea of substitute techniques and that's what I'm trying to bring up here that's what I'm trying to say here each one of these magics works because the parts of the magic serve a particular function as long as the function is served the magics can still take place it's almost like a checklist in order to do such and such magics you must have XYZ as long as you have XYZ it doesn't matter exactly what the ingredient or the is as long as it fulfills the cause and effect required magics work because you literally do XYZ and it has a certain cause and effect each ingredient has a certain effect and when you assemble the proper cause and effect cause and conditions from the ingredients you get a particular result all you have to do is make sure each of the ingredients of the magics serves the function and you end up with the result right you will have some variation in the result based on how well or what kind of accompaniments come with those ingredients the spell might be more violent the smell bite might be more benign it might work better it may work slightly less better but in the end the old the the desired effect will for the most part take place so long as the uh, functions are the 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 um, the function of each category is fulfilled so in in that case you can substitute ingredients sometimes the substitution is so vast that it just becomes a alternate spell so for example at the bottom of 38 I'm talking about the difference between Inukami which is dog deity and Inugami which is dog paper both spells seek to utilize a, a, a dog's ghost a deceased dog's spirit to be a, a helper spirit but one of them seeks to create an Inugami which Inugami is basically a ghost werewolf there's no I don't know how else to say it it's like a spirit werewolf it's a almost like a demon for the lack of a better word they're they're very powerful and if you wanted to visualize one visualize a werewolf like visualize um, and what's interesting is when when they are drawn they're drawn in human clothes so you can visualize like a werewolf wearing samurai armor or a werewolf wearing monk robes or a werewolf, a werewolf you know something like that like they're usually portrayed one of those ways like a werewolf wearing monk's robes or a werewolf wearing samurai armor that's generally how they're drawn in art but inugami are basically like ghost werewolves like spirit werewolves they are and the and they are to create an inugami it's this whole method of starving and murdering a dog um it's basically like you chain a dog or you bury the dog to its neck you do something really horrible to a dog and you starve it and it suffers and it be and it gets so aggressive and suffering there's this really really cruel and just heartless methodology that in ends with you killing the dog basically chopping its head off and then you have to do a particular ritual with the head all this stuff but you you get so much sadness and suffering and anguish and, and anger energized within the dog and then you take its head and you do something anyway it, it, and long and I'm not gonna go into all the details but long story short it creates an Inugami this kind of spirit werewolf and then you bind the werewolf and you control the werewolf or this the Inugami it's an extremely powerful and dark magics okay and it's it even in Japan you know a lot of people most Japanese don't believe in it anymore but those who sort of understand how magics work they understand this is a very dark magic and it's really really potent and powerful it's so potent and powerful that generally a particular house like house of so-and-so will have a multi-generational Inugami that an ancestor created and then passed down through generations and that and then the even to this day there are families that have to control the Inugami that was created it's literally control of responsibility for 
the Inugami is transmitted down through the ages. There are to this day house Shizoku houses, samurai descendants, Shizoku, who have to maintain and control an Inugami that their ancestor created 500 years ago. It is literally passed down. And there's even a tradition where if your house now I don't know if the, I I don't know if people follow this or not, but it is said that if your house has an Inugami, then you're supposed to not marry except into another house that has an Inugami. Be, and I think the reason for that, and I'm only guessing here, but I think is because so much time has to be dedicated to keeping the Inugami in your service that your spouse would have to also sort of have that same weight. So you both are sharing that same weight and then uh, et cetera, et cetera. But unfortunately, like if you think about it, it kind of sucks though, because then what you get is through the generations, you get some poor Shizoku who, who has like five or six Inugami they have to be responsible for. <laughs> so very powerful person, like, but, a lot of weight, a lot of responsibility. And then, um, I, of course, the way out of it is to just stop controlling the Inugami and then let the Inugami kill you. And <laughs> then that sort of like frees the Inugami and frees you and puts an end to the whole thing, right? <laughs> anyway, so that is the wrathful, horrible, like brutal version of using a dog spirit. A more peaceful version is rather than tr trying to create an Inugami, this spiritual werewolf, you would create what's called Inugami with a G. Sounds very similar. It's a play on words. But instead of dog god, it's dog paper. And that is more like a Shikigami or a kind of a servant deity where you make an origami dog. There's a particular way to fold it and the particular things you got to do. And then the dog sort of is set up in a little, you, there's a there's a little altar shrine you have to do, da, 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 da. But then the Inugami doesn't, is not a dog that you torture. So it's kind of like if, say, I don't know, there's like a local dog that just got killed or something. And then you can make the little Inugami, the paper dog. And then that becomes the nexus for that dog spirit. So if that dog doesn't reincarnate, you know, into a person, but sort of like continues on as a dog or continues on as the ghost of a dog. There's a subtle difference between being um, an intermediate being, a being that is between this life and the next life versus a ghost. Ghost is almost, ghost is a reincarnated form of that being. They've gone from this life through the intermediate period and they've arisen as a ghost. So it's important to know the difference between a being that's in between lives and a being that has arisen as a ghost. So if that being has arisen as a ghost and of a, a dog ghost, then you then the Inugami spell can they can use the paper dog as the hub, the nexus point, as their um, I'm trying to I don't know what the word is in English, but it becomes their their um uh, what's a good English? I'm sure somebody I'm sure you guys would know the word in English. It's like a it's the point at which the spirit is focused. It becomes like the manifestation point or the origin point, kind of like the home of the spirit. Um, like if you were to destroy the paper, the origami dog, then that spirit would be um, dis um, sort of released. You know, it, it becomes the, I can't think of the word anyway. But you can see, though, the difference. <laughs> you can clearly see the difference between using a dog spirit to become this very dangerous spirit werewolf versus using a dog spirit to become a kinder, more gentle, and easily releasable when you don't need it anymore um, dog spirit, right? <laughs> And that's, it's the same spell. It's like using a dog spirit as a servant, but one version is very, very violent and so just brutal with terrible consequences. And then the other version is very peaceful and very easy and very kind of like compassionate, so, but it's still the same spell, but very, very different. You, you see what I'm saying? So 
Um, well, I've talked 20 minutes now and I haven't even got to the actual spell, but this, I've, I've, I've put this in the book and I'm explaining it now because it's very, very important that you, the listener understand that these magics are not concrete. Like they're not, these magics are not passed down by an enlightened being. So there's not a unbreakable, unshakable step-by-step process. They are crafted over countless generations of of different traditions to sort of get a result based on cause and effect. So one tradition says dog servants need to become these spirit werewolves named Inu Kami. And then another tradition, oh dog spirits need to you need to be kind and gentle and just use the dog paper the folded the little origami figure, Inugami, the dog paper. And then uh, one version uses pain and suffering, and one version uses loving kindness, and you end up with a with a with a servant spirit. But in the end, even the servant spirit, one is one one is very violent and can destroy you, and the other is very very kind, you know, and easily easily released, you know. So it's important to remember that these magics are work in this way, you know. Hmm. Yeah, and then even on 38, I'm talking about the dog eye spell. In the Fukushima system, the do- the eyes can come from a, de- a deceased dog. You can take them from a dog that's already dead. In the Iga tradition that pops up later, and I, I'm not even really sure why the Iga tradition that appears later on, why they've changed it, but in their tradition, they have taken the step of saying that the dog's eyes must must come from a living dog so i don't know if that's because they felt that the spell works better if it's living so they just transmitted as living or if the person who transmitted it to them just said i don't but at some point that line of transmission of the spell has said that the eyes must be from a living dog but the fukushima system says no the eyes can be from a dead dog so um uh, that kind of is like a personal choice. So then the the spell is it's it can be the eyes of a dog does it could be live could be dead. But then later on within that uh, particular tradition that pops up in Chikamatsu's manuals at that point that line has said it has to be a living dog. So that's how again how you can see how these magics change and flux and move around. Changing the ingredients gets a slightly different result, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's kind of like if you're just, I don't know, it's like if you're cooking uh, a dinner, you know, like you're cooking a lasagna or something. And like, you know, you can still, you make a lasagna, but the quality of the lasagna is different based on the ingredients and how long you cooked it and your methodology. In the end, you still have lasagna, but it's just different, right? So that's very important to understand that these magics work like that. Some come with really, really just crazy results, but at a cost. Some of them come with very weak results, but at very little cost. Some come with very like moderate results at a moderate cost. So it's kind of like how willing are you, how in the deep end are you willing to go, you know? (laughs) So anyway, but uh, Nojiri Narimasa in that scroll of refining intentions, you know, he warns against going too deep into the magic, right? You go too deep into the magic and you'll become lost. So on page 39, uh, we'll, we'll just kind of cut ahead now to 39. Interlocking dream spell is also cemetery magic, meaning it relies on ghosts. So cemetery magic you, uh, is also known as charnel ground magic or graveyard magic. It is the magic of where bodies are interned, where the funerals take place. It's cemetery magic. <coughs> um, like I said, charnel ground magic. For those who are like well versed in sort of Hindu and Buddhist ma- um, uh, traditions, you'll know, you'll understand what I mean when I say the charnel ground or the cemetery. Mm, so yeah. Anyway. Um, because it's a it's a it's a class. There's classes of spirits that reside in cemeteries and charnel grounds. Certain types of uh, 
different categories of ghost, you know, um, as opposed to like the spirits that might be in a forest, the spirits that might be in a graveyard, you know, it's a kind of a particular classes of beings. So when you say it's charnel ground or you say that it's a graveyard, immediately you kind of know, okay, it has a particular feeling. It has a particular flavor. It's going to involve a particular classes of spirits, right? And then so in bold, I say, I flat out advise the reader do not attempt any of the spells that appear in this manual. You have to understand a crucial point. This book and these videos are solely for the purpose of, of explaining it from like a documentary perspective. At no point are you supposed to read this book or, or listen to these videos and go, oh, I'm qualified now to go do this magic. You are not qualified to do this magic. If you are qualified to do this magic, then you don't need my book or the videos. You've already know what to do. You're already qualified. Merely listening to this audio and reading the book does not qualify you to do this magic. This is for information purposes only. This is information purposes only. Now that that is well stated and I've said it clearly, we'll continue. All right, the root text says that interlocking dreams on the 14th and or 15th day of the seventh month, which 14th and 15th day is, uh, it's the moon phase. So it's, it's kind of both days, right? Particular moon phase. Collect a pine wood charcoal that has been burnt from a grave. So you're basically needing um, the residue of the light from graves. Uh, take some moss from a grave. Yep. So just, yeah. And then you later you'll see that it, any moss will do. Just, just scrape moss off of a grave. And then gather the dew that forms from the leaves of a tado plant, which is growing to the east of your own house, and uh, charred newt, male or female kudin. And there's a hell of a lot of kudin, even more than what appears in the annotations. Your own earwax, mix ingredients to an ink and kudin. Okay, so now what I'll do is I'll go through. Now that's the that's that's all that appears in the um that and a and a picture, and the picture's on page forty. So the, the, those ingredients in the picture is all that appears in the root text. So now from here, everything is going to be the annotations, my annotations, and my commentary, and uh, Terazawa Sensei's annotations. So, um, and then if you're keeping up in the book, you'll see that my words are not italicized. They're regular type, and then Terazawa Sensei's words are in italics. So, Nojiri Narimasa's are in italics. Terazawa senseis are in italics, and my words are in regular type. So let's keep all of this organized, keep it set. My words. The 14th and 15th day of the 7th lunar month, again, you've got to remember this is lunar, is the Hungry Ghost Festival. The Hungry Ghost, that entire 7th month is the Hungry Ghost month, and then the festival is the 15th and 14th, which is essentially the full moon of the hungry ghost month so the hungry ghost festival <clears throat> it's this the 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 dream spell is a ghost spell right remember i said that it's a cemetery magic so it relies on ghost related to ghost and so this hungry ghost festival taking place on the 14th 15th like i said the full moon is critical that you you do the spell this month you have to gather the materials during this time period and prepare it during and ideally ideally the uh if you could get all of this materials at during the 14th and 15th, i mean i know the time would be the 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 odds of the time working for you that you could create this entire spell and you do it during the hungry ghost festival is like the odds of you needing to do the spell and it falling just at this time is really really limited but if you could do the spell if you needed to do the spell and it fell, just happened to fall during this time period, it would be really powerful. However, um, again, the odds of the spell having taken place in its entirety during this time period, like needing to do the spell is really little, is really slim. So for the most part, you just need to collect the light that is left. So this is important. So it's not just any light from a grave. It has to be lights left during the ghost festival. And I, and I guess I shouldn't have to explain that, but let me go into a little bit. The lights left out during the ghost festival 
And if you guys want to, you can go research Oban and the leaving out of lights during Oban. Okay, there is a real significant meaning. These lights are the kind of directions for the ghost. So there's a real deep meaning of the light. And then so what you want to do is you get the residue of the light. You can't the residue of the light still remains contains the traces of the light. So you need the the leftovers from the lights that were left out. And not just the lights that were left out along trails, but the ones that were specifically put into the cemeteries. That is going to help you call those particular ghosts later on. Of course, you're not supposed to do the spell. This is just so you can understand what the the world of these Fukushima Ryu, like the world that people live in, but that's what it would be for. It's like it's part of that beckoning call aspect. <coughs> and then also the moss from a grave. Um, I'm not going to go into the details about the moss from a grave. Uh, the taro plant, you have to collect. Do so that you have to do during the ghost festival. The other parts you don't necessarily you don't have to do during the ghost festival, but you must get the the this remainder that was burned during the ghost festival. You must get this. You must get these. Um, this light and these offerings you have to sort of get that from the ghost festival it's a mixture of the light that that guides them but also it's different burnt offerings so you have to get these 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 leftovers kind of like the pinewood charcoal which was burned around the graves right you have to get that and you have to get it during the ghost festival because it's very specific then after that, you can get the moss from a grave and you can get the dew. The dew has to come from the taro. There's two types of taro plant. One is very smooth and one is very rippled, like ruffled. Particularly, this is talking about the smooth ones. I don't remember the difference in their names. Like, I think, oh, one starts with a D, one starts with an E. Uh, I don't remember, though, how to what they are. But you want the smooth one. Not the ruffled one. Uh, the ruffled one is fine, but ideally you want the one that is smooth. And it has to grow to the east of your house. And east of your own house is because it's related to the direction of east, sunrise, yada, yada, yada. Right? It has to be the east of your house. The, and then um, in the annotations you'll see where... Um, yeah 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 in the annotations I believe it's well hold on somewhere let me look yeah yeah it does say it in the annotations you have to write a particular kanji on and we'll talk about that kanji but you have to write this particular kanji on the leaf and then take the water the reason is is there's this entire tradition that morning dew is pure so the water that comes from the dew is pure water and even I mean that's real like because even you'll see like as a survival technique people tell you to like drink the dew off of plants or they say like you can wrap the plastic bag around the tree branch and then like it'll produce water that you can drink the uh, it's it's clean water right it's pure water so the water that comes off of the off the, the morning dew is pure water it's clean water and Later on in, in here, we talk about the seven roosters, and I mentioned this whole idea about the one of the one of these sort of rooster spirits is also sometimes represented as a giant phoenix or, or as a giant rooster. And there's this whole thing about how you have to collect morning dew and leave it out as an offering because the, the morning dew water is considered pure. However, before you take the water, you need to put this particular kanji onto the leaf, draw it onto the leaf, and then collect the water. So do that, but uh, and on, I'll here shortly. I'll discuss what that kanji is and why you have to put it on so many things. So anyway, you collect the water off the leaves. Now we turn the page to page forty. You will see on page forty, you'll see a picture. The top part of the picture is the spell when it's properly folded and completed, and then the bottom part is the is a brush that you have to make from a willow, weeping willow. And then also, even on that brush, you have to write up that con the same kanji that you had to write on the taro leaf, you have to write onto the brush. And again, we'll go into that. Mm, that's page 40. So then on page 41, I won't read this, but you can read it, but you'll see how it discusses um, the charcoal of the pine wood, 
the grave, moss, the taro leaf, write the kanji. And then it goes into a, this whole tradition of the newt. Now, this entire tradition of the newt is the same principle of starving and cutting the dog's head off. This is the original version of the spell. This or uh, original or the this is the th throwing all your chips in to the spell. Like this is the full blown holding nothing back, willing to take whatever consequences come from the spell version of the spell. Where you do this thing with the newts. There are there are several substitutes that you can do rather than this tradition of the newts. Basically, this tradition of the newt is to capture, for lack of a better word, sexual anguish as an ingredient. And 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 then at the end, you know, you you burn the two newts alive. So there's this. So there's a little bit of murder and and the suffering of being burned alive is also captured into the ingredient. So it's sexual anguish, sexual frustration, and then the whole sort of like suffering of being burned to death, all getting collected into that ingredient. You don't really need the murder and the burning at the end. That's that's. That's one of those ingredients that makes a spell potent, but comes at a great, great cost. It's not required. The only part of this ingredient that's required is the sexual anguish, is what is required. So there are other ways to get this in, to get a substitute ingredient. I will not go into those, but I will just say that it requires uh, the acquisition of particular body fluids from a particular individuals and we'll leave it at that but there's substitutions you can do you can substitute this one now um, whether you're using the the newt version or the one of the substitute versions uh, once you have all of the ingredients you make it into an ink like I said powder the ingredients and uh, now we're looking at the page 41 the annotations uh, powder the ingredients and then mix the morning dew collected from the leaves uh, using an ink stick any any pottery will work basically um, you are mixing all of these ingredients in with the ink and any pottery will work basically me or any dish will work um, you don't have to have a special ink stick you don't have to special ink stone it's a little dish that you when you're rubbing the water and the ink ingredients together there's like a little plate you don't have to have a special plate um, later on in the in the Fukushima Shinobi no Maki, there's this whole thing about making uh, making a magical ink from snake venom, and then it talks about you know um, how the snake has to bite the the inks to bite the dish and the stem and all this da 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 da. But in this particular case, you you don't need any kind of special ink stick dish. You just kind of use any any just root fundamental one. You just you're making ink. You're adding these ingredients into the ink, though. So you make the ink, and then it says the brush should be made from weeping willow. Write down the specifics regarding your target. Uh, before you use the brush, write this kanji, which we're going to call E, or just the letter I, E. And um, to finalize the letter, use tied letters. Write the, the tied letter is, there's a way that you fold the letter so that you can actually tie it. It makes the letter almost look like an L shape. You can use this to tie messages around arrows or to tie prayers or messages onto tree branches. Um, so it looks kind of like an L with a knot in the middle. Then, if you're that's if you're tying it onto something. But if you're going to leave the tied letter laying on something, not tying it, then you take the um, short arm of the L and you fold it back into the knot. And it looks like on page 40, you see this kind of, it looks like a piece of paper with a knot on the top. That's what it ends up looking like. It looks like you've taken the short arm of the L and folded it back into the knot. And so you get this kind of paper stick, for lack of a better word, and that becomes the finalized spell. So if you were tying it to an arrow or a branch, you would le it would look like an L. It would, the paper spell would look like an L and it's literally been tied around the, the stem but if you're not tying it around a stem you fold the small arm of the L back into the knot 
and it looks like what it looks like in the picture on page 40. And then you draw the seal of Seime on the knot, which is the star, and then the seal of Domon on the bottom, which is the which is the nine slash grid. Write the target's name on top, put your name below. When it says below it, it means not on the other side. You put the, your target's name above and your name below. And then you, uh, if there's water that you must cross, that the spirit has to cross over. It doesn't say that in here. It just says if there's a sea or river around the gates, write ship on the underside of the spell. And we'll discuss that in a second. So that's the spell. Now let's go... Um, uh, on 41, I say Terazawa Sensei is correct, but this needs refinement. Um, in discussing the issue with the newt, we have the male newts. It's not that male newts are always blue bellied or female newts are always red bellied. Male newt becomes blue bellied during the mating season when they're sexually charged. The fact that you need to have the newts when they're in their mating season is a key factor in the spell. That's kind of like the giveaway as to what ingredient is being isolated. Um, yeah, I mean, that's what's not said in the manual or the annotations, is that the spell relies on the sexual energy of the two newts prior to being killed. Uh, the, the sexual energy or the sexual frustration is residual in the charred remains, right? Due to the, so that's why I said due to the nature of the ingredient, it can be exchanged for a less cruel ingredient, right? So anyway, we're going on now. Um, now Terazawa since I didn't go into this but now I mentioned now, again you'll see this is not italicized so this is my these are my words now on page 42 your own earwax is a food offering and that may sound weird to a lot of people but if you understand how this works spit, snot, blood, pus um, earwax the, uh, these are can these are seen by classes of spirits as a food offering uh, I even talk about how sometimes you could even see like dogs will will go to eat your space so somebody not and, and it's not just everybody but it's like people who engage in continuous spiritual practices sadhanas pujas magics they they go through all this effort to build their for lack of a better word build their chi build their spiritual energy they do a lot of magic and a lot of spiritual practices they get a particular a charge to them right a particular way of being and then their spit and their earwax it becomes a food offering and sometimes you'll see that like uh, for example um uh you can see just like i said sometimes if you spit and then a dog runs over and tries to lick and eat the spit it's like well, what the dog you know but see you can see how even like dogs will go after spit or dogs will go at right so ghosts do that same thing they want human spit the more practice and the more rituals that the person does the more they want that spit the more they want that earwax i know it sounds odd but that's just the way it is so the earwax is a food offering Um, you can use spit, but for um, but in this particular case, earwax is, is the ingredient. And that's easy enough to get, so go ahead and get it, right? There's a little bit of reason why earwax is opposed to spit, but I'm not going to go into that. It's too long to discuss. Just, it's easy. It's your own earwax. It's easy. Uh, da -da -da -da. Uh, yeah, creating... Uh, the willow brush, and basically, you on uh, one end is pointed, one end is fibrous. That way, you can do big, you can do big blinds. You can do fine detail. All right. So, bottom of page forty-two. This is where um, we have to. I want you to read this section because I tried to write this in a way that is very clear. But I will then give a, f a brief commentary. The kanji e is. You got to write it on the brush and you got to write it on the taro leaf. This is because it connects the Issei shrine, particularly it connects Amater <coughs> Amaterasu. Oh, hold on, let me take a sip of water. I have been talking for like 45 minutes, so one moment. Yeah. All right. Writing that kanji connects it to Amaterasu, particularly the Issei Shrine. The Issei Shrine is filled with potent energy. 
If you channel energy from the Issei Shrine to the object, you are literally like importing energy from the Issei Shrine to the object. The easiest way to do that is to just intend to connect the Issei Shrine to the object, particularly writing the kanji E. Now, when you say, why does writing the kanji E connect it? Because just E say it's written, but the reason that E is on E say, on e say is the same reason that E is on E ga, for example. The kanji E is composed of two parts. One means human or people, and the other means to direct or to make order. When you put the two together, it means to direct humans. Okay, and what what it represents is the sun goddess, Amaterasu. Issei means Amaterasu's strength or Amaterasu's energy. And even the play even, even the region of Iga means Amaterasu's joy. Right? So that kanji E comes to represent Amaterasu's divine authority. So when you write E onto the object, you have to, there's a way to do it. You're just writing it and not caring about it isn't going to work. There's a method of doing it. There's a way of doing it, visualizing, chanting, intentionality, etc., etc. There's a way that you write it on the brush or on the brain, and it directs, it basically says like giving Amaterasu authority over that object, connecting that object to Amaterasu connecting it to the power that is come from, that is res contained within the Issei Shrine. So when you write it on the brush, you basically infuse the brush with the power of the Issei Shrine or bless it, by, bless it with Amaterasu's presence. Yeah, yeah, so then you also, you write the you write the seal of Seime, which is a five-pointed star, and the seal of Domon, the nine-slash grid, onto the paper spell. Now we're on page 43. My words. Uh, this is also Issei magic. So this is very like a lot of Issei magic. This is very Issei, right? Now, the I've written it out here so I don't have to go into it a bunch, but basically Seimei was an extremely powerful um, sorcerer and Domon was an extremely powerful sorcerer. Seimei was basically... Um, Abe no Seime is the stronger of the two. And Ashia Doman, I, I hate to say weak because he wasn't weak at all, but he's sort of the second. So Abe no Seime and Ashia Doman were always like kind of, they were contemporaries, they were a little competition. And one time they did compete and, Doma, and um, Seime won. So Seime is like number one, Doman is number two. And Domon was really, really big on using the nine slash grid to expel and exercise demons, ghosts, goblins, etc., etc. However, Abe no Seime was a little bit stronger, and his his particular special symbol was the five point star. And so Domon would use the grid to sort of expel and protect, and Seime would use the star to increase the power. But according to f folklore and oral traditions or legends or whatever you want to call it, Seimei was, a, was some, some, vers some stories say Seimei was actually half a demon himself. So because the thing was is Seimei never really had to worry about protecting himself from any spirits. It was said that Seimei could just command spirits just by telling them what to do, they would do it. Well, like if, if some evil spirits were going to attack Domon, he would throw up the grid and be protected. Seimei would just tell them, stop, go home, and they would just stop and, and would not attack him, right? So that's why Seimei was more about power, building the power, building the power, building the power. So Domon, in a way, Domon is like the defense and Seimei is the offense. So you can think like Seimei is to build power and push forward and then Domon is to defend, right? And so... It, when you put Seimei and Domon onto a, 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 um, an object, it, like, it increases the power of the spell and it prevents any spirits that are not supposed to be involved with the spell from getting involved. 
and you see this as a very very like at the Issei shrine to this day they still sell and give away whatever you know give away sell whatever um amulets that have the seal of Domon and the seal of Seimei because putting both of those together is a standard practice you always put the five point star and the nine point grid on a spell it's a standard practice because it increases the power of the spell and it defends against spirits who aren't supposed to be involved getting involved uh, yeah so uh, bottom of page 43 to finalize a spell the letter is placed back in the graveyard if there are rivers lakes or any major body of water nearby you need to write the kanji or boat uh, for boat on the back of the spell mm, yeah like the what it or how do I say yeah so I think I won't go into a whole lot of detail on this one but essentially the key points are if the spear if the if the ghost that is going to you fulfill this spell is going to have to cross water from the graveyard to your target if they have to cross water like especially if they're going into a castle and they have to cross a moat like they pull the the there's no way to get in right it is surrounded by a moat right then you have to put boat on the spell giving boat on the spell will give the spirit special permission to cross over the water I know this sounds very awkward to a lot of Western audiences but certain classes of spirit are dispermitted from crossing bodies of water it does a long explanation but to keep it short and simple many spirits can't cross water so a human has to give them the authority to cross water if human gives them the authority to cross water then they can cross water so by writing boat on the spell you essentially give them the permission the capability to cross over the water at least for the period of time in which they are fulfilling the order written on the spell this spell you can as with almost every other paper spell you can consider this as a order like literally a an invoice or not an invoice like a an order form like you are filling out an order form you know like I want you to do XYZ here's the order form you give them you give the ghost the order form it's like the ticket here's the ticket and the ghost reads the ticket okay I have to do XYZ and they do XYZ and then it's like special permission oh by the way you have special permission to cross water oh good now I can now I can do this you know um, kind of like um, you know like <laughs> like almost like very mundane job here's your ticket and here's a temporary special permission so you can fulfill the order oh you know like that so uh, without going into too much detail it's like that so I have to put boat on there to make sure that they're they're allowed to cross the water and I say that on the on page 44 remember paper spells are like an order ticket which you present to the spirit world you write your request sometimes it's in code sometimes it's very plainly like you see paper spells they have all these complex you know kanji designs with symbols and stuff you know and then sometimes they're just a series of kanji with a few symbols uh, you seal and bind the spell properly when done correctly particular spirits will receive the orders and carry them out that is why it's important to put seal of same and domon on the spells you don't want any any random vengeful ghost getting involved you only want the ones who have the authority to fulfill the ticket to take the ticket once the spirit has the order the spell provides them with directive and all pro provides them with permissions such as boat to carry out the task in exchange they must have access to something they want and in this case the ghosts get to consume the essence of the materials in the ink many ghosts are essence and smell eaters and the materials are very worthwhile for them so essentially you are getting a particular class of spirit to carry out your intention to invade the dream of your enemy and we'll go into that a little bit more but the thing is that ghost needs something it has to be the proper concoction 
in order to get the ghost to do it. And the ghost does it because one, you've properly written the order ticket and uh, presumably you're spiritually powerful enough to have the authority to write the ticket. And then on top of that, so that the ghost is essentially like fulfilling their duty to someone who issued a legitimate order. And then on top of that, they get to sort of partake of the adventure and they get to partake of the substance within the ink, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is why you have to provide the correct substances and you also have to be spiritually qualified, meaning you literally have to be powerful enough for the order to be considered a legitimate order. So it's two parts. You must be spiritually qualified and you must have the proper substances in order for the spell to work. Now, if the spell works, then what happens is your the interlocking with the dreams, basically the dreams of your enemy will become affected and all manner. So then you can invade the dream. It's almost like that uh, movie Inception. You can invade the dream. You can input your intentions into the dreams. Uh, the the enemy the enemy commander. It, it creates almost like a pathway. Um, this is kind of also related to your ear the the your earwax. But anyway, I won't go I won't go into that too deeply. But you have the ability then to sort of inception, for lack of a better word, the enemy commander right or or the enemy general or the, say that you want to make an enemy commander believe that his close retainer is going to betray him so you keep putting these dreams you keep influencing his dreams he keeps dreaming of his enemy commander betraying him and then uh, it disrupts the relationship between the two or say that you want this guy to betray his boss and and turn to your side so you keep putting this into his dream, putting this into his dream, putting this into his dream. And he doesn't realize that he's being influenced by an inception type spell. He thinks these dreams are coming from him, right? So then he's thinking, okay, that man, I'm, this is something I really need to do. This is just really what's I'm dreaming about, you know? And, and then they think that their dream is act is their own thoughts, but really it's your thoughts you've been, been putting into them. And then, so you can use it to sort of, get somebody afraid of something or get somebody to mistrust someone or you can get it to get someone to betray somebody but basically you want to influence somebody to do a particular action and and this is a very a very advanced way of doing that is to literally make them dream about this particular thing make them dream you know about this make them dream and then they really believe that this is like they they might think it's a sign from from the gods they might think that this is their deep seated emotional need or whatever you know they think that this is like their own this is coming from their own mind really it's you're whispering these things into their dreams you know you're you're invading their dream you know and sometimes this can take the form of the um the ghost getting into them while they're sleeping sometime in some versions of the spell you have to be asleep and it actually connects your dreams to their dreams um in this particular case this is more about the ghost getting into their dream um it's not really so much about like your dream being tied into their dream it's like your the ghost you've sent is now haunting their dreams and as it haunts their dreams it manifests as the the idea that you want them to dream about so how do you defend against this well um in some ways defense against this is uh if you do a lot of uh, buddhist ritual like buddhist puja buddhist sadhana uh, protector rites um then the ghost can't get to you because literally there's too much sort of protective forces protective deities etc and the ghost is dispermitted the ghost is not allowed the ghost is not capable of, of affecting you um, so on one hand, I would just say do Buddhist protector rites and, you know, authentically, like legitimately, authentically do Buddhist protector rites and, and all and this ghost can't get to you. There's also different amulets you can wear. Um, the there's one to protect against bad omens. Um, and I won't go into all the details, but one is you basically take 
uh, you got to get fox skin and some bat blood and there's a particular thing you have you have to write some some different syllables and stuff and uh, within take the bat's blood write particular syllables onto the fox skin roll the fox skin up bind it in a red string and wear it in a particular way and wear it that protects against bad omens and or and uh, but om protecting against bad omens means in this case omen means protecting against negativity building against you and when negativity build against you it manifests as a series of bad omens that keep appearing and, and each time a, the next omen appears the negativity is building and building so this kind of bat blood fox skin amulet thing um, you don't you don't just get bat skin a uh, bat blood and fox skin and making it you there's a there you have to write particular things there's a particular way to prepare the amulet but we're not going to go into that um, mainly because I've been talking for an hour now. So, but that annually sort of disrupts the chain of, of bad omens building. And then there's another one that can actually uh, seal your dreams from ghost influencing you by, um, it involves, you got to find somebody who's like a very, very, almost like a Buddhist yogi. You have to find someone who's, mind is like gone beyond somebody who's a real serious practitioner who's sort of really like very advanced practitioner and then there you have to like get particular things from them and basically well you have to find somebody who's a very advanced practitioner you have to get a piece of their like the clothes that they were because usually like these advanced practitioners generally like yogis right they don't really change their clothes they kind of like sit and meditate in caves and so they wear the same robes or or tattered cloth so you and they wear it every day and even the cloth sort of gets residual um energy residual qualities from them so you have to get a piece of what they're wearing and then you have to get uh some of their spit and some of their sweat and some of their tears but it, it has to be tears that are cried out of compassion right so tear and then anyway and then there's a way and then you gotta do so, there's a way you do special stuff with the with it and it make an amulet and that amulet will actually just per, see prevent any ghost from getting into your dreams so a combination of these two amulets the the one to prevent the successive building of bad omens and the one to seal dreams from evil spirits the these two amulets together would can would cancel out this dream magic or like i said you can just be a serious do serious protector rites like um uh, what are called like dharma palas dharma protectors do serious dharma protector rites uh, and that also could, there's so many different rituals that you could do, but they, they'd have to be authentic, real, legit, seriously practiced protector rites. And if you can't do them, you could always find like a, a yogi or a monk, and then you could give them some kind of offering and then ha ask them. And they would, of course, because it's, they do. If, if you go to a monk or a yogi and you say like, I need a protector right done on my behalf, they'll do it, you know? So give them some kind of offering and then beseech them please you know do such and such protector rights uh, i would i need to be my dreams might be compromised and then they would do you know these successive protector rights for you etc 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 so either you would do the protector rights or you would get a yogi or a monk to do the protector rights for you but they would do successive protector rights etc etc and that would also block off and seal protect you so whether you could use, you know, like Dharma protectors or whether you can use these amulets, you would have to basically cut off the ability for ghosts to influence you and cut off the ability for negativity to build. And if you hit both of those points, either by amulets or by protector rites, then the spell would be completely ineffective. So because of that, one who is uh, one who is a nojiri, uh, no jiri narimasu, or uh, one who is a no jiri, yeah, but no, sorry, <laughs> one who is a Fukushima practitioner, um, whether they're Kumazawa, whether they're no jiri, whether they're Murakami, whether they're uh, Oyamara, whatever, you know, whether they're Terazawa, whatever, you know, <laughs> if they practice Fukushima, do you, then they would 
on one hand know these magics and do these magics but then at the same time they would also be equally doing the counters to these magics because once you know that such magic exists and once you do such magic you'd be like really stupid if you didn't do the methods to protect against the magic so therefore you got to understand that they so like the Fukushima Shinobi right Fukushima Ryu Shinobi would have a lot of time spent doing the magic and then defending against magic so um, that's also you see that again like I said in the Southern Court Loyalist you know there's all these sort of spells for attacking and spells for defending so there's a lot there's a lot of Buddhist ritual puja sadhana protector rites and a bunch of these magics taking place so almost you can say this sort of Fukushima Rushinobi or this Kusunoki Ru conspirator or these sort of Southern Court loyalists is there's this perme like ritual practice and magic is permeating but again it's not permeating just on this sense of casting the magic it's also permeating on the sense of defending against the magic you know if you're using dream magic you're going to then defend against dream magic right so whatever spell you use you then have to counter the spell you know so yeah because you don't want to be you don't want to use a, a technique of which you don't have a defense against right so yeah that's uh, more than an hour's worth of me rambling on but um, that addresses the first technique of the manual and some point in the future we will continue on <laughs>